Welcome to the Highland Heights Bible class. We are on week eight. Mm -hmm. week, week eight. eight. Week eight. And uh, we will we'll continue on until we are meeting together on Sunday mornings. And we hope that that happens sooner rather than later. Um, now, when you're seeing this video, uh, I guess we'll have the second Sunday of announcements about Wednesday night classes that are, that are going to start on July 1st. Yep. Uh, there is a men's class. There's a women's class. There is the, the usual auditorium class, which will be continuing on in John. COVID-19 cannot stop Wayne from getting through the book of John. So um, uh, I know everyone is looking forward to being back in those class settings. Also, uh, high school, middle school, club 345, and then younger kids starting at age three and up. So lots of wonderful classes to get back to. But in the meantime, we're going to continue on with our study of Acts chapter two. Um, if you haven't been with us before, if this is your first time watching, uh, we are glad that you're here. We invite you to pause the video right now, go read through the chapter. It'll give you a lot of good context, uh, and that'll catch you up to where we are. I'm going to start our reading tonight in verse 42. I'm going to read through verse 45. Verse 45 is the meat of what we're talking about tonight. So let's read, uh, read Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 45. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Okay, verse 45, we've, we've heard this before. It's just the most wonderful potluck that ever was. Uh, so, uh, Jeremy, when, when this occurred, you know, thinking about the time frame, like what exactly is happening here? Um, it's kind of some general phrases about selling possessions and belongings. How exactly do we think that this was happening? Who was involved? Uh, who is, who's all? Is it just the church? Is it everybody? Uh, what's going on here? Well, I think it probably, it, the immediate context is the foundation of the church. As we've talked about before, you have pilgrims from all over the world, um, both within the Roman Empire and without the Roman Empire. They have come to Jerusalem um, from the Jewish diaspora for um, either for Pentecost or maybe they have come for Passover and have stayed through Pentecost. Uh, in that era, that would not have been an easy journey. Um, you know, if you've ever had to take a trip, you know, you need to make sure you've got enough money to actually take the trip and get there and have what you need and things like that. Um, and then get home again. Well, now they've come and they have heard this message and many of them, um, they've left their businesses, they've left their livelihoods back. Um, maybe they've closed up their business um, or taken a hiatus or something like that. And they've traveled to Jerusalem and they've become part of this movement. And so they're staying in Jerusalem. They're learning from the apostles. They're growing closer to one another. Other, one another. There we go. Um, they're growing closer to Christ. The problem is they've only got so much money and that money is going to run out. And so what's happening here is really it's, it's kind of a basic hospitality custom of the first century um, just done on a, on a, on a more, on a broader scale, I guess you could say. Um, they are taking care of their fellow Christians. Um, you've got people who, they don't have the means to continue. And so the Christians who live in Palestine, who live in Jerusalem, are selling their possessions, taking the money, and helping to take care of their fellow new Christians. So I want us to talk just a little bit more about like what they're selling. But before we go on, um, you said, sorry, I'm uh, backing up. Uh, you said that this was a first century custom. First mm -hmm. century custom for who? For Christians, for Jews, for anybody? Well, it's okay. What I meant by that was the the hospitality customs of the first century. Um, okay. You see, when people travel to an area, what what happens is they will be welcomed into a into a town by someone. Um, not all of the inns were places you would want to stay necessarily. Not all of them weren't, but not all of them were either. And so, you know, if you had someone who was kind of a, a fellow traveler you would invite them into your home. We see this happen with Paul a lot. 
during his missionary journeys later on, he'll come to, to a community um, and he'll first he will go to the synagogue and because he's a traveling rabbi, the local Jews will welcome him in and they will help take care of him and they will they will put him up. Um, if he's going to be there for a longer period, he will he will probably start um, working in his own business. We see that in Corinth where he worked as a tent maker, which was his, his trade. Um, but that's the kind of thing that would happen is when you had a, a, a pilgrim or someone come in. You um, they might not stay in a hotel or an inn. They would stay with people, um, and so you've got a lot of that going on. Is is that hospitality? But what's happening is they are selling the things that they have, fields, um, things like that, to provide money to help these people. Yes. Yeah, so, so they they were planning on staying for a little while. You know, it's right. a long way to get there. So you want to stay at least for a little while. But now that little while is mm -hmm. expanding. You know, that their their lives have been changed, and so now they really feel like they need to be here for a while. Right. Um, yes. And so this is kind of bleeds into the rest of the New Testament. But the church in Jerusalem, you know, the the local church there is likely the ones whose possessions, belongings, or land, as Barnabas will show us later on. Mm -hmm. Their stuff is nearby, and so it's really easy to sell their stuff. It's it's a little harder to send a carrier pigeon uh, back to Rome and to say, "Hey, I need to sell my stuff and send the money over, send it, you know, Western Union." Um, so that you can't do that, and so the church right. in Jerusalem is giving up their possessions. I I only bring that up to foreshadow that Paul will be collecting for the church in Jerusalem from. Uh, the churches throughout throughout the empire to say, hey, remember how they helped you out in matters of faith and probably also in matters of money. Yeah, let's let's send it back. Reciprocity is not always the best way of uh, making decisions, but it seems to work here. Still, yep. Well, and and to to add to that, um, we don't have any record of the church in Rome who founded it. Um, a lot of commentators believe it was founded by Christians who were in Jerusalem, okay, at Pentecost, you see Christians in Rome, or Jews in Rome referenced in Acts 2, and then they took it home. So when Paul makes that, he's taking up a collection for Jerusalem, and he mentions that in the Roman epistle, he's mentioning it to people who quite literally lived that out mm -hmm. 20 years earlier, you know, hey, remember, and so they are, so here's an opportunity for them to pay back or pay it forward, if you will. Yeah. Um, so we, we have people who are giving, people who are receiving, they are part of this new family, and it's allowing them to continue on and to uh, continue to learn together as yep. um, the church is expanding from 120 to 3,000 souls, or mm -hmm. 3,120, whatever people want to Okay, so is this a biblical principle? I, Jeremy, I thought the whole point of this class is to learn what it means to be in the New Testament church. Is this a throwaway verse, or is there something something to be learned here? Oh, no, it's, it's definitely not a throwaway verse. Um, this is, in many ways, um, an application of something we've talked about, or at least alluded to earlier. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the miracles, and we pointed out that we can't do the miracles but we can do some of the things that the miracles were pointing to. Well, that's literally what's going on here. Um, how many times in the gospels do we see Jesus helping people? Um, he's not, the miracles, they, the, per, the um, purpose was to show Jesus authority, to show his approval, but it was also to help people. How many times do we see him chastising the Pharisees for not being willing to help people when they could? Well, here's Jesus saying, here, I'm going to help these people. I'm going to provide food. I'm going to provide healing. I'm going to provide um, what they need, not just their spiritual needs, but also their physical needs. Okay. This is, in, in a very real sense, part of the Great Commission, which we talked about um, in the past, um, where Jesus tells them to teach others to do, um, to teach others what Jesus has taught them. He tells the apostles that in the Great Commission. Well, they're teaching them to help people just like Jesus did. Okay. So this idea of charity, you see it run and, and it's not just here. You see it run throughout the new Testament. The idea that, look, we are supposed to be reaching out and helping people. Um, we are supposed to be there 
for people to aid people. Okay. Um, so, you know, can we do miracles? No. Can we help people like the miracles did? Yes. Um, in a sense, this is yet another thing where God says, hey, I left you here to do this. Um, when I was growing up, we had a program called Future Leaders, um, and we had to memorize. We, there were a lot of things that we did, you know, the, the title Future Leaders, it was to teach leadership and things like that, um, as well as basic Bible facts. And one of the things we had to memorize for points, it was always real easy. Everybody did it because it was only three points when we did it, um, although I think they added one after I graduated Future Leaders, um, was the three works of the church. And um, the three works that I had to memorize were edification, evangelism, and benevolence which is what's going on here. Um, the idea of doing good for others. I think later they added worship, but um, here we're dealing with benevolence. Okay, so let's just, let's hit on this just a little bit more, because uh, I, I think that this gets into the idea, uh, some of the other ideas that we're gonna talk about. Who's in the group? You know, who is this benevolence for? And I think where we're gonna go with this is to say that here, like in this verse specifically, it's talking about the church, yes. but in all other, in many other verses, it bleeds out into mm -hmm. benevolence for the community. Um, and I get, so then the follow-up question is um, how, you know, uh, how do we decide what's benevolence and uh, uh, what is required of us, which I, I think we'll even say that that's not the way to think about it. No, yeah, that I would, that's, not the way that, that I would think about it. Um, obviously, you're right. Here in this um, text, it's referring to within the body, but you can see how it goes out of the body as well. And again, Jesus didn't just meet the spiritual needs. He met the physical needs of people as well. Um, and so that's our calling, to help people with their physical needs. Now, we need to remember that help helping people doesn't always look the same um, you know, well, you, you think about if, if you have kids, what one kid needs to help one child needs is not to help another child needs. Um, and not, not just when you consider the difference in ages. Um, and that can get real interesting if you have kids that are close enough together that the younger one is wondering why the older one can do things they can't. And the younger one's wondering how come you're doing this for them and not for me. And it gets real fun, trust me. Um, but also, they're different kids. I mean, you know, they're, they're not the same. They don't have the same personality. So, you know, we need to be cognizant and aware that, and the, that help is not always the same. Enabling is not helping. Okay? But we also need to be wary that we don't turn every opportunity for enabling in, or for helping into, well, that's just enabling. Um, so we need to make sure that we are looking at every single situation individually and looking for, okay, what can we do to be in someone's life to help them? Okay. And, um, I mean, you look at it when Jesus, um, talks about, uh, one of the passages where he talks about separating the sheep and the goats. Um, and he looks at him, he says to the ones on the right, he says, you know, you saw me in prison, you saw me hungry, you saw me this, that, and the other thing. You saw me in need and you helped me. And to the ones on the left, he says, you saw me in need and you didn't help me. And the ones on the left say, well, but, 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 but we worshiped you and we called you Lord, Lord. And he's like, yeah, but you didn't help me. Well, when did we see you? When you saw someone in that position. See? So, you know, we, here we're looking at the church, but it's clearly a calling where, we need to look out for one another within the church and build those bonds of fellowship, but we also need to look outside the fellowship. And, you know, you think about it, there is an evangelistic purpose to it. Um, we've said before, people don't know, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. This is, this is a way, to, you know, we are teaching people about Jesus. One of the things we're teaching people about Jesus is the love of Jesus. What better way to teach people about the love of Jesus than to show the love of Jesus in their life. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'll add there is uh, an old non-biblical proverb. Um, an empty stomach has no ears. 
you know, if, uh, it, which kind of gets to the idea of, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you, you have to have, which I think is sometimes good, sometimes not true, but uh, building off of the needs that someone has when they see that you care about their more basic needs, food, hunger, uh, shelter, uh, then they're more likely to, to listen to what you have to say about other things. Um, but also, you know, the, the enabling kind of gets to not only how do I prepare someone to take care of themselves physically, but how do I prepare them to take care of themselves spiritually? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's going on here is they are, they are learning from the apostles about how to carry on when they go, when they're not um, at Jerusalem church camp and learning all of these, uh, you know, having the best teachers right in front of them. So you, you have to be prepared for when the apostles are not there anymore. Uh, when, you're, when you're not around this strong group of Christians, how do, I, how do I continue to grow? So they're sharing not only possessions, but their spiritual lives as well. Okay, um, any other thoughts there? I know, uh, okay. So often, um, well, let me, let me say this. I've heard more people say that people will use this to refer to communism than I've <laughs> actually heard people try to make it refer to communism. But anyway, let's go ahead and talk about the point. Yeah. Um, I, I remember one of the first times I heard th these verses and had, had them preached on. It was uh, talking about what does this mean to, to share things? And um, we'll try our best not to get too political here, although it's kind of required for the subject matter. Um, how, does, how does one get to be a part of this? Is it required that I share all of my items? Does that go against property ownership? Um, what's the biblical teaching here, and does it apply to any political ideas that we might have? Um, no, it doesn't apply to any political ideas that we might have. Um, oh, really? No, I, yeah, I would, no I would say. Political application. De depends on how you define political, but I would okay. say in most cases, no, this is not a political issue, and, and here's why. Um, one of the most famous examples of this, of, of the sharing and selling of your possessions, actually blew up in the face of the people that did it, and the reason it blew up in their faces, they did it from, poor, from bad motives, and then they tried to lie about it, um, Ananias and Sapphira, and one of the principles um, that comes out of that is Peter looks at, at Ananias and Sapphira and says, was, was not the field yours to do with as you please? Um, and and there's, there's a deeper principle there, and that is, look, you cannot be called to sacrifice something that is not yours, okay? This is not about looking at someone and saying, hey, you need to step out and you need to sell your possessions and you need to help people. This is a personal responsibility for everyone. The reason Barnabas was lauded was he didn't sell the field so that everybody would look at him and say, wow, Barnabas is a great guy. He was a great guy, but that wasn't why he did it. He didn't do it for the accolades. He did it because people needed help. Um, it's not a sacrifice if it's not yours. Okay. Um, so this is a personal responsibility. Okay. Um, now, can it transcend into larger ideas? Yes. But it is at its core a personal responsibility. You take from what you have and give to others as they have need. Um, that doesn't mean that, that we can't pool our resources or give to the church and allow the church to, um, to, to use that money as they, as people need it. That, that's not what we're saying here. Um, but this isn't about anyone else. And, and you think about it, people do from time to time kind of, again, say, well, so-and-so, someone needs to do something about that. And then they sit back and they all sit and turn and wait for one another. Um, it's um, kind of like uh, an economics concept, the tragedy of the commons. It's not perfect. Um, and, and Michael, I don't want to step on your field and your toes on this field, but you know, the, the, this, I, um, the, the basic idea behind the tragedy of the commons and, and Michael, you can 
correct me if I, if I get the summary a little off, but the idea that a commonly owned resource, un, an unregulated commonly owned resources, resource will be depleted because there's no incentive to conserve. Well, this, it's, it's not a perfect analogy, but you think about it, we all, if we all kind of sit around and wait for someone else to do something, it's kind of a, a tragedy of a common apathy, I guess, um, where we sit and we say, is, is somebody going to do something about that? Okay, so it's, it's one where we are called on to make the decision for ourselves. And you think about it, that's a larger application, that's a um, more specific application of the entire idea of faith. You can't have faith for someone else. Right. You can't sacrifice on behalf of someone else in the sense of your sacrifice is accorded to them. Okay. Um, you can only sacrifice what is yours. So the idea here is it's a personal responsibility. Um, and, you know, Ananias and Sapphira, why did they get in trouble? Because they didn't do it for the right reasons. They didn't do it to help. They, they did it because everybody wanted to say, ooh, look, they wanted everybody to say, ooh, look at Ananias and Sapphira. They're great. And, and then they tried to lie about it and cover it up. And God's like, why are you going to lie to me? You don't even have to give it all. You just give what you, what, what you purposed in your heart. So it's not, it is a responsibility of Christians. But it's a responsibility that every one of us has to fulfill in as we can. Well, uh, agreed. Uh, and Jeremy, as you uh, you said this at the beginning as well, that the way that each of us fulfills it is different because we have been blessed with different skills um, that are rewarded in different ways. Um, some of us have, have time to give. Mm -hmm. uh, or we have words of encouragement to give. You know, we are we are blessed with with different skill sets that allow us to give to God's kingdom in different ways. And so, while there seems to be a monetary physical possessions focus here, we shouldn't only talk about those things. Um, kind of go, going back to uh, some of the ideas that you were developing there, uh, I guess that the one place uh, in I don't think we disagree on the politics here. I think we disagree with uh, with the way that we should use the verse. I, I thought you did a good job of using verse forty five to say no. It doesn't mean this, you know, this far reaching idea about um, having you know common ownership of all things. It certainly doesn't mean that. Um, I, I would say though that there's a, so that um, that's using it in a negative way. It doesn't mean something. I would say that verse 45 has a positive meaning as well, uh, that we do have a communal responsibility in a small sense, in a small uh, community. Um, the world functions a whole lot better when local knowledge is used to take care of local problems. Um, all right, uh, to any of our listeners, if you are a huge fan of uh, uh, short-term missions, mute the video for like the next minute <laughs> because I don't have anything positive about them that I'm about to say. All right, so short-term missions, other than like medical missions, I'm going to put that over to the side, but it often involves spending a lot of money on a plane ticket to go somewhere to serve a group of people who we don't know that well. I really like, um, I, Wayne watches our videos, so I will compliment his daughter, Marley, who goes on I would say medium term missions, but does it continually is always going back to the same place in Brazil and building up relationships there. On the other hand, um, when we go abroad uh, to solve, solve problems uh, using our lack of knowledge, we, we lose the advantage of uh, using local knowledge to solve real problems. Um, I, I'm not sure how recently they've done it, but I know that our middle school in the past has had basically work camp here locally to take care of local problems. So as these individuals are selling their possessions, uh, giving their belongings as any had need, that as any had need is representing knowledge that they had about each other. So it is showing that there was a communal sharing going on but it wasn't some large bureaucratic 
Um, it wasn't government. It wasn't theocracy. It was a community. It was a close-knit group of people who were taking care of each other. Um, okay, uh, if you're still muted, you can, you can come back on now. I'll stop ragging on, on short-term missions. Um, there is something, uh, some people would say, oh, this is an American idea. Actually, no, I, I would say that this is a Western idea that was taken from the church, that we should build our society around small gatherings of people, um, that everyone loves being a part of a club. Uh, we're the only, uh, this is not true. I'd like to think that we're the only country with bowling leagues. You know, we like these little groups of people that get together for a common purpose to do something. Well, the church at its best is, uh, is overall, we are a group of worshipers. Uh, but within our worship, we band together. We are a church. We are a, a, uh, a mob of people that come together to, um, to have this common uh, fanatical cause and one of the things is, Jeremy, as you mentioned, one of the works of the church that we are fanatical about is taking care of people, perhaps first ourselves, first those within our community that need it, uh, but then others on the outside. Uh, let me say one last thing, and then I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Um, I think in order for the church to operate on that local knowledge, takes kind of two people to have knowledge there, the person that needs to know about the problem and also the person that has the issue or has the need to vocalize that issue. Now, every once in a blue moon, someone will see the problem. It won't have to be vocalized and they'll be able to take care of it before anyone asks. But most of the time, it works a whole lot better if people say what their needs are. Sometimes those are monetary. Please let your monetary needs be known. Sometimes it's, I need a break. Uh, I, need, I need you to help me out with this. I, uh, Stan put up on Facebook, I need a truck. Someone, help him out with a truck. I wish, Stan, do you need my Prius? I don't know. Um, doesn't carry stuff. Yeah. How do we help out people? Let people know about the, the needs that you have. That, that's part of the knowledge uh, going on here. And just to wrap it up, uh, it helps with this idea of the tragedy of the commons. Um, when we talk to each other, it's a whole lot easier to manage that common resource so that we, um, we're not depleted. We're not out of energy. We're not out of resources before we're able to uh, carry each other's burdens. Yeah, right. Mike, I, Mike, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And um, just to, to build on that thought, on the other side of it, I think sometimes we we let our pride get in the way, um, or we we don't want to be a burden to um, to people. And if you think about it, we need to be there and be helping people and let our needs be known. But we not only so that those needs can be met, but also so people can meet those needs. And and I realize that sounds like I'm repeating myself, but how can people help if no one says, hey, I need help? Um, well, just we, to repeat what I'm hearing, hearing you say, um, for the need to be met helps me. For other people to meet the need helps them. Exactly. It's allowing them to serve. And exactly. I'm blessed. Hey, I'm blessing you, Jeremy, by giving you a job. <laughs> Yes, I, and I appreciate that. Every, every Tuesday night when we record this, I appreciate that. Um, but, but, you know, we need to make sure that we don't allow a sort of cultural pressure of, hey, I can do it myself. I'm an individual. Um, or a fear of, you know, I, well, I, just, I don't want to be a bother. No, 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 no. Let, step up. Or, well, okay be willing to say, hey, I need help. That's, that's not being a bother. If you, if you genuinely need help, that is not being a bother. That's what we're here for. We uh, talked a few weeks ago about the concept of social capital. Okay, the, the building up of that social capital where if a tragedy happens, you've got people there to hold you up and to help you. Okay, um, or just a major event in your life happens. Um, Amy has said um, on numerous occasions, she does not know how we would have survived the last 16 years without the church. 
Um, and just about every time we have moved, and uh, in 16 years of marriage, we've lived in eight different houses slash apartments. Okay, um, <laughs> there's a there's a lot going on there. So you know, and and one of those was the townhouse when we moved here, and we were there for like five months. So you know, but we've lived in a lot of places. Just about every move on at least one end or the other, the church was there. Um, when we moved here from Texas. Um, one of my coworkers from school or future coworkers from school, I hadn't even met the guy yet, um, met him that day. He came and he helped us unload the truck. And then he drove from Smyrna up to Antioch and spent another two hours unloading the rest of our stuff because we have entirely too much stuff into a storage unit. I mean, you know, I just, I've never forgotten that. And I'll bring it up in Bible class at least once a year. And then he'll look at me and say, you talked about moving again. Did Yes. I talked about moving again. Um, and that's just one area where it's like, and it's a, it really is a, a small thing in the grand scheme of things, but the willingness to say, hey, I need help, okay? Not only are you being blessed, but you're blessing the people who are helping you because they, are, they have the opportunity to help. Yeah. I, 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 I'll be honest, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I think we're running up against time. Yep. Uh, Jeremy, yep. one other thing from your notes that I wanted to hear you talk about, uh, and then we can go to closing comments after that. Um, we believe everyone is the Imago Dei. Is, is Imago made Dei, yep. of God. How does, that, how does that change the way that we act? Well, what would you do for God? Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, and no, we're not God. But if we really believe, and this is, I mean, I've mentioned this most, um, several times now, because I think this is so important because it, A, because it's important, B, because it, it literally goes back to the core of who we are. We are made in the image of God. What does that mean for how we see people and how we help people? Um, we don't all look the same. We've talked about we don't all need the same help. Um, some people... Some people need help. Some people need to be told, no, you, you are capable of standing up on your own and doing this on your own and, and you need to do it. Um, you know, and, and that's help for them. The old saying, um, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, um, you feed him for life. Um, I've never found that appetizing because I don't like fish, but you know, Hey, some people do. Um, that's the core of that is seeing people made in the image of God. Um, we need to take action. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite examples of this idea of taking action is we are pro-life and I think we should be, I think that's a good thing, but I think sometimes we're, we're, we're very pro-life in a political sense, which, you know, we, we, we need to be out there saying this matters and it's important to culture and society to protect all innocent people, including the unborn, but don't let it stop there. Um, don't let it stop with political activism. You know, I, I love that, that we um, collect money for our crisis pregnancy center. Um, the, the baby bottle thing. I, I love that. Um, because that's so important in helping people who, yeah, okay, they made a bad decision and now the consequences are coming back to hurt them. What are we going to do? Are we going to say, be warm and be filled. God bless you. Go with God. Or are we going to say here, let me help you. What can I do to help you? Um, can I, can I drive, can I take you to the crisis pregnancy center? Can I, can I give you resources? Um, can I help you with clothes? Can I help you with, with food? Can I help you find a doctor? Can I bring you into my home? Um, obviously that's a much bigger commitment, but you know, um, can I bring you into my home and help you? Can I offer to adopt your child? Um, you know, when, when this is over, if you can't raise it, I'll take it in and I'll raise it as my own. And, you know, that's a, that's a big area, but, but that's one important area. And you can expand that to all kinds of other areas, feeding people, um, helping people with addiction, um, all of those things. They are made in the image of God. Do we see that? And how does that, how does that change our life? Okay. What does that do to the way we treat other people, including how we care for their physical needs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, 
it's so simple yet at the same time it is the, the essence of what it means to see people uh, through the eyes of God and seeing God in them. Um, I think we're, we're probably over time at this yeah. point. Um, we, we've hit on a lot of things. Uh, Jeremy, I usually hand it over to you. I know you, you were just talking, but do you have a, a closing thought for us, something to take away from what we've talked about tonight? Um, what does James say, pure and undefiled religion before the Father is? Uh, he says it's to remember widows and orphans in their distress. Um, we've talked before about James and Paul um, and, and their differing applications of faith, and we've talked about how they're coming from different purposes. James is so valuable because he says, he's basically making the point, faith should change your life. This is part of that. I have faith in Jesus. Okay, what does that look like? Okay, that looks like Jesus, who when he saw someone who was hurting, he helped them. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll use your transition uh, from James to someone who hated the book of James. Uh, <laughs> Martin Luther once said, um, the last part of a man to be converted is his pocketbook. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it is, uh, anyone can say, Lord, Lord, anyone can be dipped in water. Um, when I start taking your money, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Now, now we're getting serious. Now we're getting personal. Um, the economist in me wants to say, your money is a representation of your time. I, you know, minimum wage is seven bucks. Maybe you get paid 15 bucks an hour. Every 15 bucks you give is a representation of an hour of your life that you are giving to God. How much are you willing to give? You know, how much are you willing to set aside and to say this, uh, God, someone told me I'm worth this, but I, am, I give my worth to you. Uh, so uh, if that's the last part of you to be converted, then, then give it over. Uh, one last thing that, uh, that I'll say. Um, the question, when was the last time you had someone over for dinner? Um, I think that uh, Jeremy started us, our Bible class off by talking about charity. Uh, I think we should end it off by talking about hospitality. Um, hospitality is an extension of charity that we are, uh, let me put it this way, it's comparatively easy to give someone a $20 bill, to say, hey, here you go, hope your luck gets better, that sort of thing. It's harder even to invite friends over to come to our house or to invite, you know, that acquaintance that's kind of more on the edge to say, hey, come over, let's share a meal together. Uh, because it is personal. It's, it's going into my space, my protected time. Um, and so I, I would say an extension of verse 45 is not just giving possessions, it's giving of, um, it's giving of your life. And I, I think your life, uh, flows into all sorts of places where if you let God take over, it will change all of those different parts. So um, that is class eight of our series on Acts chapter two. Uh, Jeremy, where are we going next week? Praise. Pray. They were with one another praising God or with one another in the temple praising God. So we'll talk about praise and worship next week. That'll be good. Uh, yes, looking will. forward to the conversation. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone in church on Sunday. Um, obviously, you're watching this video on Sunday or the next time we see each other. So, yes. see you then. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. Bye.